On the podcast today, we're going to speak about how Western psychology and Eastern spirituality view the eye, the differences, and the way they go about healing the eye, so to speak, or, well, in Eastern spirituality's perspective, dissolving the eye. So both views have a completely different perspective of how they view the eye, really. Um, There are some similarities, but in the world today, a lot of people see the world through the Western psychological lens, even in developed parts of Asia, right? So, and this also lends into uh, differences in culture between the West and the East about how we view the eye. And obviously, as we mentioned, this is we got to go deep into Eastern spirituality to understand this perspective. Yes, um, this uh, kind of topic was always something that I had in mind, uh, like a kind of a big question, mm. because... As you mentioned, around the world, predominantly when we talk about psychology, we just naturally we think of um, Western psychology, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we have that kind of a view on psychology, but again, like we we are very um, passionate to study the Eastern spirituality. So it also exploring the psychological side of it and mm-hmm. also having a deeper inquiry of what I is really mm-hmm. and all those things. So that how do they, is there any kind of um, relationship between those two mm-hmm. or if there isn't then how different they are and how... Uh, the point of views are different mm. from both um, side of um, yeah, point of views and things like that. <clears throat> well, look, even when you look at, for example, transpersonal psychology, right, in the West, uh, transpersonal psychology from an Eastern perspective is very paradoxical because uh, the person is, is trans-psychological. They transcend psychology. I mean, mm. from the Eastern perspective, sorry, the, the, the fundamental source of, our, of, the, of ourselves transcends psychology. So the Atman, yeah. which is Brahman, transcends psychology. But we have, in that, so this is kind of leads into how the West deal with the eye. The, the, the eye is always as related to society, culture, yeah. someone's religion. It's, it's a social construct in the West. And so, for example, when you go to see a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist and they're trying to make you feel comfortable within your sense of persona. Mm. And uh, also surroundings that you're in. Yes. Mm. Yeah, so the environment you're in, the society you're in, the culture you're part of, they want you to feel comfortable in that. Now, if we contrast that with the East and you go to a satsang in India, for example, <laughs> and you are learning Vedanta, especially Advaita Vedanta, you have to transcend all of these boundaries we actually create in our mind and, and come uh, are, are inculcated within us as, as we accumulate this sense of self as we grow as a human being. Yeah, I mean, it would be quite in a contrasting uh, reaction, I think. If you were to say that, oh, I feel so uncomfortable, I feel a very like an old in the world, in society and whatnot, to the spiritual teacher, mm. then the teacher will say, oh, this is very good. Very good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the response yeah, yeah. that you'll get, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, I remember a satsang with uh, Muji actually back in 2010. And there was a, a guy, he was probably in his 40s, and he was a really nice, nice fella. This is in Tiruvannamalai. And he said, like, I, I don't have any social interests anymore. Like, because mm-hmm. he, he'd been practicing self inquiry, the path of Ramana, Ramana Maharshi, and uh, Advaita Vedanta for many years. And, and the gentleman said, I just don't have any like, social interests anymore. And Muji was like, oh, very good, very good. <laughs> so, so it's. So it's completely different, you know what I mean? It's completely different. Uh, whereas, like, if you said that actually to a psychotherapist, they might think, wow, this guy is completely antisocial. Mm. And completely, like, maladjusted. Maladjusted. Like that, yeah. And he's, he is, uh, in some sense, disassociated with his sense of I. Because, yes. Because they think that, from the Western psychological view, they think that I is, is a be all and end all. Like, is mm. the. This thing in the prefrontal cortex that we all have, this mm. this ego, this uh, analytical self, is the be all and end all. But in the in the East, as you know, we, we go through the, the 
the history of all of the great traditions of the East. It's all about down-regulating this and coming back into contact with something much deeper where there's not really a sense of self there. So that would be the danger about, you know, I wouldn't recommend anyone who's on the spiritual path to go to a psychotherapist and say that. Like, <laughs> I don't have any social interest anymore. They might, you know, like you said, they might think you're maladjusted and put you in the in the loony bin. But, you know, so, so you, you'd want to avoid that. But it's interesting, right? Because, you know, they are completely different perspectives. Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to address, actually, early, that um, Western psychology is based on Western material science. Mm. That's why material science is what this mug is mug, and this body is body, like affirmation of this physicality, Mm -hmm. right? That's... Mm kind of a starting point mm. and then they oh, I don't know they put into um, uh, put a material object into laboratory and then they <clears throat> analyze and separate into pieces pull and apart and yeah pull apart and like compartmentalize everything and they name it differently and mm. all this kind of uh, process begins right mm. so that's very um similar process of um, doing western uh, psychotherapy i think yes. they uh, somewhat almost like a, affirming this body is you mm. this yep. flesh mm. is i mm. right yep. So it's almost in the, in the Hindu perspective, you, we could say affirmation of jiva, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Whereas in um, Vedanta, they study to go beyond the jiva. Jiva is is maya, is an illusion. Mm. So that we need to go beyond that, beyond this physicality, right? Mm. Beyond uh, this kind of physical world, almost, mm. right? Yeah. So that's completely different. Um, the start point to start with yes. that Western psychology is con- uh, affirming the superficial physicality. Yes. And that's how they almost identi- identify things, right? Mm. Identify an object, identify an in the individual, something like that. Whereas um, Hindu's perspective is completely opposite. That uh, not... Almost deny, not necessarily you're completely uh, ignoring the existence, mm. but just to go beyond that, go transcend this physical realm and exploring that world. Yes. And uh, yeah, so see what happens there, sort of thing. Yeah. The understanding is that this is a vessel for the, the consciousness to express itself. And the consciousness being the Atman, being the Brahman which is a unified state of consciousness that we all share. But this is like a localization of the one consciousness. It's just the equipment. This is the equipment of the localization. So imagine if you went into a, a psychiatrist and you said, I know that this is just the localization of the one consciousness. <laughs> and I just, I've still got that little bit of remnants of jiva there. I can't, I can't get it out of my system. Oh, it'd be f- yeah, I, know, it'd I can't be- get it out of my system. So. <laughs> Again, you're, diff- you're talking about different terminology and, and whatnot, are you? So it's not, not for them to understand, but but it it, it just highlights that it's a completely different view of how both deal with this this sense of I. And you know, even if we look at all of the paths, even if we look at Taoism, Buddhism, even if we look at the the various paths in India of yoga, Vedanta, Sankhya, the the the, the ways about reaching this the ultimate state are different in those parts but um the the idea is the same that this is the vessel of of this some one underlying state of consciousness okay we could say in vedanta you have different um different uh, vedic paths like you have vaita you have vishishta vaita you have advaita but the understanding is still that there's this one consciousness it's just it's framed differently and understood in different terms and and, and, and I mean, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that, but you get the picture. So, whereas, um, so we have that common, there is that common understanding in the East that this is kind of a vessel. And like what you were alluding to a bit before, is that it's, it's almost a cultural thing, right? Like the way that the West perceived the eye, the way that the East perceived the eye. And then it's interesting because when we look at individualism in, in the West, 
that's again why Western psychology focus on the the social self, the the ego basically. Nothing about transcending the ego. I know there's transpersonal psychology and this and that, but it's not at the level of Vedanta and and and, and spiritual paths like that. So you it's a cult it's a, it, it, almost a cultural thing because mm-hmm. the the west has only not only but they've mainly focused on the analytical part of the mind the prefrontal cortex as they evolved mm-hmm. especially through greece in europe because uh, you know particular uh, activities and that were individualistic rather than say in china and india where things were more uh, social and more uh, group, collective. collective more group oriented which is more about the the unconscious regions of the brain and also not having this super sense of ego because you belong to something much greater than yourself in this in this sense the community or the society which actually then reflects the the religions of both parts of the world right because yeah. in the in the east you have a big focus on a it's, it's more of a holistic they're more holistic traditions because it's based on uh, society and, and, and sort of a, a collectivist view and so these are these are the big differences and, and affect the way that we study the eye. And you know, you and I have, have experienced this, especially on my channel, where I get a lot of Westerners watch my channel, obviously, and a lot of people will frame Eastern spirituality through either their Western prism and mm-hmm. and and unfortunately a lot of the time people frame Eastern spirituality through uh, Western political agendas. So and that's still a Western prism, mind you. But that's, that's very unfortunate that they can't see the traditions as they are from an Eastern perspective. That would be like saying, let's have a look at Western, the Western political ideological realm through an Eastern holistic perspective. It wouldn't make sense. You have yeah. to see it through its own mm. lens. Mm. It wouldn't make any sense, I don't think. No, it yeah. wouldn't make sense. Mm. And so that's one of the unfortunate things, especially I find on my channel, is that a lot of people do that and you know obviously they get triggered about it because they have their own personal political leanings and don't realize that vedanta Taoism, and buddhism is, and all of this is about the dissolution of this and that and if that looks like left wing or right wing to you then that's your problem it's not their problem they're much older traditions than the western political ideological realm these are traditions going back thousands and thousands of years so yeah, it's it would be pretty absurd to like dissect whether Taoism or um, Buddhism or the Hinduism, uh, whether uh, <laughs> right or left. Yeah, that makes no sense. <laughs> that that would be a little bit uh, sounds very strange. Strange, yeah. Mm. But that's what you know. Yeah. I get a lot on the channel, and it's yeah. really, I mean, it's just odd, you know. And and I've tried to converse with those people in an intelligent manner. And sometimes those people, you know, the conversation goes south because they're probably just trolling and stuff like that. Yeah. But that's, that's, you know, that's only to their detriment because they're, they're not willing then to understand the Eastern perspective. And that's where it's very different, right? Because the East have a very lucid sense of I and so it's not really stringently holding on to certain views mm. and opinions um, because the idea is to be humble and to get rid of, opinions and and worldviews and so forth and so on right so and i think that it's a very actually somewhat sad that like how eastern spiritual parts are not um, well embraced by easterners nowadays yeah, yeah, yeah. because again the reason why when we think of psychology we just automatically think of western psychology is because the Far Eastern Asian countries and also like even now nowadays India is jump on board on to this new um, very westernized ideology and whatnot. Mm. So the predominantly around the world is very westernized and modernized, mm. I think. Mm. That's why this the this way of um, Western psychology uh, go about things. Mm somewhat fit their way of thinking yeah. of today modern day right mm. whereas if you were to have a just a little curiosity of eastern spiritual paths it's um, it, it has definitely its own benefit and it's much it's quite it's quite sophisticated science 
of mind, really. Yeah, of course, yeah. So that there's a huge, huge um, advantage to study uh, these things. And, but it's quite sad that people very, very like almost overestimate this Western way of living, thinking, mm. and just they build a life around that kind of um, style, isn't it? Yeah. So they, again, like you get mocked when you talk about these Eastern traditions in Eastern countries. Really. <laughs> That's weird. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, isn't it funny, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. One of the oversights is, like you mentioned, with the, the Eastern traditions being a science of mind is, again, the Western lens has infiltrated parts of, like you said, in, in, in the East, but also the way that the West view, say, for example, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism, in, in and of themselves, they are not religions. They are mind sciences, and, and, and especially with Hinduism, it, it's a culture. It's, Sanatana Dharma is like a complete system of, of it's a way of life. And so you have these sciences of mind that are then framed as a religion from a Western perspective. Mm. And this happened a lot, obviously, when, <clears throat> especially when the British went to India and you had certain people translate Hindu texts and they were trying to work out what is God and this and that. But all of those ideas in the West are completely, they, they don't equate to like the Gita and, and no. so forth and so on. Like, like if you explain like the the Muslim and the Christian God and you try to find that in the Mahabharata doesn't it's not there because Krishna and and Vishnu are completely it, it's it's an idea it's a concept that completely transcends this idea of a uh, of a political analogy of God yeah you know and so again we have to also remember that you know in some sense Christianity and Islam have a very political in their leanings and the Eastern traditions don't really have that. It's more about, again, the science of mind. And, and this is why in the modern day, a lot of people are attracted to Eastern spirituality because you know, people are really struggling in their lives mm. and they're trying to look for ways to overcome their suffering. And f for whatever reason, going through the idea of Western psychology and, and so forth and so on, is not a real... Uh, a, a, like a real way to end suffering mm. because you're trying to keep alive this sense of I mm. and you're trying to just fit in with the environment and be okay with it but there's something deep inside you that's going this is not this show can't go on for too much longer you know and like what you were alluding to like there's also in the east it's not that they don't they don't have their own psychological approach eastern psychology is much older than western psychology when we look at samskaras vasana and karma right like it's a far older system thousands and thousands of years old and so we don't why don't we look at that eastern psychological approach rather than just looking at freud or or, or jung or someone like this you exactly know? and again the western psychology has its own benefits too mm. as in like a, a it's very i see it this way that it's it's actually somewhat limited like mm -hmm. you said mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, no, it's just very functional to fit into the society, yeah. basically, yeah. right? How to just change, shift your perspective a little bit just to make your own peace within yourself to mm. live in the society and whatnot. And if um, anyone who had a like, very traumatic experience and it's still you still suffer from that memory then it may help you of course, and yeah. this very um functional it's uh, functional role in place for anyone's problem right yeah. but again like, as long as you as long as you affirm the existence of this i in 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 the physical form mm. then it is very difficult to transcend the, the transcend this world and really f being free from suffering, mm. right? Mm. Again, in the Jungian psychology, the ultimate uh, goal of uh, psychotherapy is individuation. It's called individuation, mm -hmm. which is being a complete individual in the society who um, overcame all this. Uh, childhood trauma or emotional uh, problems and whatnot. Mm. 
so that you live, uh, I would say, live a reasonably healthy physical and mental state in mm. the society. Yeah. And that's kind of an ultimate goal. And uh, again, in compare, if you were to put that into uh, hin- uh, Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, then that's almost like only the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Even when you look at, uh, yeah, definition of I, let's say, in the Western psychology, it's like just id, they call id, 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 mm. it's a primitive state, primitive, prim, prim, primitive uh, consciousness and ego, which is that ego mm. and super ego, super ego meaning like idealistic self, yeah. and things like that. So like the ego and I, a battle between the id and the super ego, so try to make the balance mm, and going mm-hmm. through that process of that individuation. Yes. But if you are to talk about what I means in the Hinduism, is like a waking state, dreaming state, and deep sleeping state, and beyond the fourth state of consciousness. So it's uh, much more in detail and more, much more I think scientific mm. waking as a waker's state of mind dreaming and dreamers state of mind the deep sleep deep sleepers state of mind and then beyond that well we can also say a a u m mm. as well yeah. waking a om mm. a waking u is uh, yeah, dreaming mm. m om mm. and m is deep sleeping and after that, silence, yes. which indicates that um, yeah, Turiya conscious, consciousness. And that fourth uh, state of consciousness uh, resides in all, th- all the other previous three state of consciousness. And that Turiya state of consciousness or is, is ultimately where we all, where we all reside in. Mm. And that realization is the whole process of this um, uh, yeah, uh, self-inquiry and spiritual discipline and whatnot you go through. And again, ultimate goal in Eastern spiritual path will be liberation, mm. right? Moksha. Moksha. Go beyond everything, beyond suffering, beyond ego, persona, attachment, transcend all these things and also you've mentioned that in uh, uh, some kind of a hatha yogi uh, practice that there is a practice where you go through to cleanse out all your blueprint of your yeah of um, ancestors dna that you, you like running through you and going even beyond that that mm. it's such advanced science yeah i think mm. so Again, like I said, the ultimate goal in the Western psychology to me, it looks like only the beginning of um, Eastern spiritual path. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So in that sense, it's much more uh, yeah, scientific and deeper um, study so that you see a lot of people around the world who go and see this psychiatrists and psychologists and study themselves of uh, this kind and whatnot but they mm. see this kind of limit that yeah. how it this this doesn't really lift your burdens mm. in your mind yeah. and they turn into eastern spiritual paths yeah yeah it's so interesting when you look at the four states of consciousness as opposed to like you said with the id the ego and the super ego that the one of the defining differences and you know, you mentioned it with Turiya being that residing state, the the Atman within us all, uh, as opposed to the waking, the dreaming, and the, and the deep, deep dreamless sleep. Those three states are experiential, you see, uh, and Turiya is non-experiential. It's yeah. not. It's not an experience. Mm-hmm. It's a state of consciousness. It's not an experience. Mm. It's not an event that can happen in time and space. It's not bound by social constraints, by culture, by religion, and this and that. And this is one of the massive differences between Western psychology and Eastern spirituality because they have this component in Eastern spirituality that the West don't really have. 
because the West is a, it, you know, obviously the id, the, the ego, and the super ego is are, are about ex, ex, the experiential realm, mm. about how you experience the world, mm. and about you know the society you're in, the culture, you're in, mm. and 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 way in between these, you know, the primal state and the the the, the idealistic or too moralistic state of of mind that is constantly to and fro with our state of ego, right? Like it's not that that does, it's not that that you mean psychological approach isn't mm. real it is real like because we all battle with that every day but it's still in the experiential realm and that's that's one of the massive differences between eastern spirituality and, and western psychology mm. because they don't have really this idea of like non non-experience mm. so kind of this infinite void of nothingness that we all come from we all res- ha- you know like to use Taoism, for example, you have Uchi, and Uchi is like this infinite, it's kind of like you could say the Tao of stillness. And then you have the movement out of Uchi, which is all of the Tao in motion, which is Tai Chi. So the experiences of life that we experience through the, the energies of yin and yang, mm-hmm. but always at, the, always at our base as Uchi is this state of infinite nothingness, which is the way of nature, the way of nature is stillness. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't experience that a lot in our mind, but that's, you know, again, just to illustrate that there is this non-experiential voidness in Eastern spirituality, Shunyata in Buddhism, right? Like it's it's not an experience. Mm-hmm. And this is why enlightenment isn't an experience. It's not an event in time and space. It's actually your natural state of consciousness that we are just out of, accord with because we've been brought into this world and mm. we've created this accumulated sense of self which is dictated you know in some sense by the id, the ego and the super ego but if you look from the eastern psychological approach you know you have your your karma your vasanas and your samskaras so you have all of the things you've accumulated in your subconscious that affect your habits and tendencies your vasanas which att- which affect your your karma, your actions and your unconscious actions. Mm. And so, you know, and, and obviously in, in Eastern spirituality, it's about reversing that, reversing that mentality, you know. It's, um, it seems like that in Western psychology, when you were to um, get uh, this uh, therapy on your mental state, mm. for example, there is not specific like um, practical things that uh, individual can do mm. on their own, mm. is there? Mm. Like, whereas Eastern parts is there's many like many different way to practice these things. Like yes. Meditation, one of <clears throat> the biggest things, and uh, yeah, breathing exercise and. Um, yeah, mantra, mantra, hatha yoga, and all these uh, like uh, eight big yogi parts yeah, for sure. are all about that. How you can discipline on your own mm. way and mm. this and that. So, in that way, it's almost like uh, exploring your yes, some some skaras and vasanas becomes you bring that to your the conscious realm mm. i think mm. so that it, you are you become able to see what they were yeah right mm. and to cleanse uh, cleanse that out and that's the process of that the mm. will of samsara yeah. framework but um i don't know in the western psychology is more so like they're analyzing their dreams right yeah and you talk it out. With yeah, those. talk it out. Yeah, they ver- we verbalize, verbalize it. it. Yeah. And Which they all help too. But it's, yeah. But I think that, you know, to your point, is that what the East do is they give you practical tools. That you can do on your own. You can do on your own and yes. you can, or with the teachers of some mm. sort and, and to try and deal with that mm. and to live a more shanti life. Yeah. And it's much more, you could say much more like visceral. It's more like on the, it's more, like yeah. you, it's a sense like 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 what you mentioned before, Buddha Shuddhi, right? Buddha Shuddhi is a whole science and system in Hatha Yoga about cleansing 
your ancestors' DNA out, your mom and dad's, to see the world as Shiva sees the world, mm. not this or that, just mm. seeing it purely for what it is. And you, you, you've got to engage yourself in this science to cleanse all of these things out through Hatha Yoga and through, obviously, a lot of other things, diet, so forth and so on. But it's all it's a practical system to get you to that place, and, and it works. And the the West don't really give that many tools, like like you, like we said, like there's verbalize it. Um, you practice self observation, obviously. You've got to be more observant of yourself, which these are good things. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong, but it's easy for people to slip in that. And and again. It's not framed through the idea of overcoming the jiva. It's yes. framed through the idea of Gayang has to be Gayang in society. Mm-hmm. She has to accord to Korean cultural traits. And this is where it becomes problematic because it might be the Korean cultural traits that are causing you suffering. You see? Right. Uh... They might, that's what might, might be causing you suffering. You just don't vibe with them. But the psychotherapist is saying to you, you know, this is how you can feel comfortable within this landscape, within this environment. So it becomes problematic then, right? Because for you, you're telling them, I don't, I don't have, a, I'm not good with the Korean cultural traits and I don't really agree with them. It, it doesn't resonate with me. Mm-hmm. And so their perspective is you have to kind of submit and accept it and look, there's some truth to that too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, to accept things the way yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. But that's horses for courses. Some people is, it, it can accept it and some people can't and will need a different method. And so that's where Eastern Spirituality comes in and goes, look, you don't need Korean cultural traits. Just blow it all out of your system and, and come back to the world of Shiva. Come back to the world of Tao. Because that's the real world. The Korean cultural world will continue to transform through evolution and will be completely different from what it is now to what it will be in 200 years' time. We see this in the, like a movies, like psychological thriller or mm. something like that, mm. is that like in the, in the movies that uh, viewers would see that particular, particular character in the movie is completely normal in, in the different um, standards, let's say. Mm. But... Then um, psychologists or someone would just keep judging that character as in like a psychopath or mm. some crazy person or something like that. Mm. And so I think that it is pretty um, strange to say that everyone should be able to adjust to society. Mm. I think everyone mm. is different. They're different. And yeah. for some people, the society might not be the place for them. Right, but yeah, in the Western psychology is is to uh, support the individual to be able to adjust to the world as much as possible to find their um, safe place for themselves. I mean, it has its uh, uh, benefits too, of course, because we all live in a society Mm. unless we become like monk or priest or something, Mm. but. Yeah, but I think we need to keep that in mind that um, not everybody is made for this kind of society, I don't think. And uh, since you mentioned that um, practice to uh, cleanse your blueprint of your ancestors and DNA and things like that in Hatha Yoga, that is also to show that how different... In the East, they view uh, ourself hmm. in a way be- because in the in the West, um, me is me. It, it's just me, like right. And they try to um, find a way within the this body. Hmm. Try to find the answer of why am I not happy or something like that hmm. within their own limitation. That is to say, a very categorical way of thinking mm. of the of the West. Mm. But the East, in the East, they Im- somewhat identifying us. This body is not just uh, belongs to me mm. per se. Mm-hmm. It's all come from 
our parents and parents come from their parents mm. and we are also carrying all their blueprint and DNA of mm. our great 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 grandparents or mm. something like yeah. that which makes so much sense yes. and the fact that in yoga they have it has such practice to cleanse that blueprint mm. itself mm. to me is so inclusive mm. and also it's very yeah scientific at yeah. the same time as well it understood knowledge itself understands that uh, i as a person is not just limited to this body mm. only it come from many gener- generations before yeah yeah so that's that's the thing like in yeah, the but the buddha should be is um that that practice essentially is the cleansing of the elements mm. but it's the cleansing of the because as you were mentioning we ourselves as a physical thing are an accumulation of the elements you know we are the sentient life is a manifestation of the planet right and so it's a cleansing of those elements to get to put to siddhi which is you know the enlightened mind mm. once it's completely cleansed once the because the, the elements contain memory this contains memory. Your ancestry that's flowing through you contains memory. You know, you're you're wearing your your grandma's eyes right now. You you think your grandma's long gone. Your great grandma, for example, you think she's long gone, but you're wearing mm. her face. And so it doesn't mean you change your physicality, obviously, but you, it, it means that there's the memory in the in the in the in the, in the elements, mm. and that's throughout our lineage throughout. You know, our ancestry and you know what 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 is a problem with this from especially when the west view what we're talking about is that they look at buddha shuddhi and they say oh well th- these guys just want to dissociate from you know their family dissociate from the world around them and that's actually you know from an eastern perspective that's how you liberate yourself mm. from this life yeah and Look at Ramana Maharshi, for example. A lot of uh, Western psychotherapists have said about Ramana that uh, he was completely dissociated with his sense of I. And it's kind of, you know, it's, it's funny from people who understand the teachings of Advaita Vedanta and understand who Ramana was, but it's really interesting, right? Because like, that's how they see it. But Ramana was completely free from the age of 16 and he wasn't bound by society, lived his life, but they don't see that as freedom they see that as some sort of dissociation with his sense of self mm. and it's like well he didn't suffer ever again he didn't he was never engaged in forced servitude so, you know so forth and so on right what do you actually want for the individual because that's what right. he that's what he did mm. so you want someone to just uh, acquiesce to any sort of society or culture uh, even though it runs counter to their actual sense of being you know and <clears throat> that's why a lot of people as you were talking about that that it, not everyone is the same right but this there's a lot of people who have this spiritual calling that that know that wait up it's not it's not within this religion it's not within this culture or this society there's something else you know what i mean there's something greater than this and and you know as as campbell said you've got to kind of lean into that You've got to accept the calling, the call to adventure, and follow that path. You know, and you know, in talking about Ramana, and and and, and we talked about Jung. You know, a lot of especially Indians and that will will make the example that Jung had the opportunity to meet Ramana, but didn't he didn't do it because maybe it would be too, you know, mind boggling. Maybe, but I don't know if there's much truth to that. But that's a, a common story that mm-hmm. goes around. Because Jung's framework is built around the, as you said, the individuation. Where Ramana, there's no individuation. It's just everything's exploded, and there's just all that's left is the ashes of Shiva. You know what I mean? There's, there's no I. Mm-hmm. There never was an I. Yeah. And see, that's the difference, right? In Eastern spirituality, there's never was an I. The ego was always an illusion mm. that you've engaged with. Yeah. So your awareness got entangled with the material world, the psychological world. Mm. And then you have this sense of Guy Young or Jason or whoever's listening and watching. Mm. It's because we got entangled with these things of the world. And then we, we then, you know, with the super ego, then you start to have this idealistic sense of self and morality and, 
and so forth and so on, where you're out protesting and this and that, and this is you know anti spiritual to to that point because that's your awareness entangled mm. with worldly affairs, with worldliness, as the Buddha would yeah. say. Right. And Buddhism is about overcoming worldliness. So is Hinduism and Taoism, mm. because the identity, the true sense of self, the pure awareness is just of itself. It's non. It's non experiential. It's just a state of consciousness that's just there that you can tap into once you Cleanse. once, once you uh, de- disentangle your mind mm-hmm. from your awareness from the material and psychological realm, mm. and that's the that's the main point, you know. Yeah. And that's where you know, a lot of Western psychology can't accept that perspective mm. because it's too far it's almost gone too far because it that's where they start to talk about the disassociation the dissociation with the eye mm. the dissociation with your sense your persona and so it's completely different right like mm. and it's interesting that they don't accept the traditions that have been around for three thousand years yeah you know what i mean if we look at the, the, the vedic tradition right we're talking about probably 1700 uh, B, a BCE or a lot older. Yeah. We don't really know. If a Vedas and, and old scriptures been written around that time, that means the knowledge existed much more before, right? Exactly. Yeah. It was an oral tradition. Yeah. So, and I don't understand, you know, maybe it's just a Western bias and maybe because it's, it's a cultural thing as well that those tr- traditions can't be accepted. You know, as a, as a proper study, mm. we only we've only seen it really through like Evan Thompson and and, people, and scholars like this that yeah. will will accept ancient mm. knowledge as as an as an authority mm. on certain things like consciousness and awareness, pure awareness, in relation to modern mm. psychology. Mm. But it's, it's very difficult. It's a it's a big gap, you know. Yeah. It's only because that they can't put this Eastern, the spiritual parts in the frame of um, material science. Mm. They want to, they don't want to include to their um, subject of study. Mm. But yeah, again, that's just purely cultural. It's almost yeah, it's by biased way of um, seeing things. I think. Well, it's what you. To your point before about science, about material science, about psychology, it's based on materialism. Yeah. So Eastern spirituality is not based on materialism. No. There's an understanding of what the material nature is, mm. prakriti, but yeah. then that's maya. Mm. That's uh, the illusion. So it's it's about transcending the material world, hence Buddha Shuddhi and all of these practices, meditation. I mean, if meditation. Uh, wasn't real if it didn't work why would anyone really practice it exactly and you know but this is what the east provide they provide us these tools to Mm. transcend suffering Mm. not to work within the limitations Mm. of a society and a culture and a religion that can produce suffering so and that's about it really isn't it yeah, I mean, going forward, as you mentioned about um, the scholar like um, Evan Thompson, for example, he himself is a psychologist, but he grew up uh, in such an Eastern spiritual environment because of his father. Mm. And he's very um, supporting and also very actively accepting monks' experience in deep meditation. And he understands that uh, state of mind when we go into this deep uh, uh, spiritual uh, discipline Mm -hmm. and he tries to uh, put that into uh, somehow in the western study of psychology form so uh, again going forward hopefully uh, there's uh, more scholars who are trying to bridge gap between these two and um, just try to understand at least the eastern path mm. and the advantages of following that path as well and mm. only that way i think it can break that uh, limit mm. they meet when they only study western psychology well we hope that we're doing somewhat that on this podcast right mm. we hope that people can start seeing eastern spirituality 
from an Eastern spiritual perspective yeah. and not from a Western psychological mm. or Western political perspective. See it as it is. And this is, but again, sometimes to see it as it is, you've got to start to cleanse the jiva out. <laughs> you've got to cleanse the jiva okay. out. You've got to be like Zhuangzi. You've got to, there's no more this and that. You only see the infinite in all things. Mm. Difficult state to come to, but... You've got to be flexible and quite versatile in your mind. You know? Exactly. Mm. And you've got to... See, once you are like that, then you are not emotional. You're not attached to this or that. Mm. Ideas of left and right, right and wrong, all of these things evaporate because they again are subjective and they again are part of a human flaw where we discern between this and that. And that is a measuring, that is maya, which, you know, creates all the trouble in the world. Mm, big time. <laughs> so, guys, we hope you enjoyed and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>